Proverbs chapter 9, and we're going to do the first six verses there this morning. So let's read those, we'll pray, and then we'll get into the Bible study. So Proverbs chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. Wisdom hath builded her house, she hath hewn out her seven pillars. She has killed her beasts, she has mingled her wine, she has also furnished her table. She hath set forth, set forth her maidens, she crieth upon the highest places of the city. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. As for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, Come, eat of my bread, and drink of the wine which I have mingled. Forsake the foolish, and live and go in the way of understanding. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, again for the day. Lord, uh, every Sunday is a milestone, Lord, bringing us closer to being with you. And so, Lord, we pray, bless the gathering together, Lord, of your saints, Lord, for Sunday school here this morning. Lord, again, I pray and ask for your help to teach, Lord. Because I never want to fall into the trap of trying to do this in my own power and wisdom, Lord, because it'll fail. It needs to be you. It needs to be about you. So we pray, Lord, glorify your name in all that we do here this morning. And we pray and ask for it in Christ's name. Amen. First six verses of this proverb are going to continue with the context that we had in the previous proverb here uh, using a, you know, a figurative feminine personification of God's knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. So verse 1, <coughs> excuse me, it says here, you know, she built her house. The house and the pillars are both uh, produced by the wisdom of God, the wisdom of the Trinity. The Lord's house, in this instance, is certainly not a reference to either the tabernacle or to the temple, as both of those places of worship were assembled and erected by mortal men for mortal men to worship the Lord God in. You know, and while there is, of course, a temple in heaven, which the Lord showed to Moses when he had him up there in the mountain for you know, 40 days and goes down, breaks the tablets, goes back up. <laughs> You know, no, I can't believe it. 80 days he's up there in that mountain, okay, no food, no water. That's definitely the grace of God. You know, but he shows him the pattern. He says, make this after the pattern that I've shown you in the mountain. Well, God showed him what's in heaven. You know, that's over in uh, Exodus 25, verse 40. You know, but it is, that isn't God's house either, okay? Uh, because the universe itself cannot contain God. Go to 1 Kings chapter 8. In 1 Kings chapter 8, we have the uh, Solomon dedicating the temple that God had him build. Verse 27. 1 Kings 8, verse 27. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens, okay, that's the third heaven, cannot contain thee, how much less this house that I have built it. Okay, the truth is that the universe is contained in God. God is not contained in the universe. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 1. have a tendency to want to limit God to being human. And 
he's anything but. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 10, 11, and 12. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. They all shall wax old as doth a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. The universe that exists now, one day God's just going to wall it up and create a whole new thing. It's contained in Him. And I know that's hard for us to grasp, but it's, it's because of who and what we are. For us to be able to begin to grasp the... I mean, it's not even about size or vastness. It's entirely about power and magnificence. You know, and all that God does is by a knowledge and a wisdom and an understanding that is so far beyond our capability to grasp and to understand to even be able to, to think what the, 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 the absolute depth of that is when you think about the complexity of the universe when you think about the complexity of even these rotten mortal bodies. Uh, and God, in his design, not only designed that, determined that, and how it would all work and function together, but simply spoke it into it. How, how do we even begin to comprehend what that is? The Lord is not bound by, is not limited by, the physical laws of the universe which he created. That's why when the Lord Jesus Christ got up out of the tomb, it's just so mind-blowing. <laughs> yeah. That body that had laid there three days was instantaneously changed into a glorified body. And he got up and just walked through the walls of that tomb. Nobody had to move that stone. The angels came down later and rolled the stone away from the door so that the human beings could see that he wasn't there. You know, and they went back and forth to heaven. You know, that that morning, doing the things that he had to do, and then he shows up in the upper room. He's just he's just there. He just pops right in. Hi guys. <laughs> Here I is. <laughs> Uh, you know, we get we get frustrated with God because we don't understand why are you doing what you're doing. But we can't even begin to understand. You know, it 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 it'd be like some MIT computer, you know, scientist trying to explain things to an ant. <laughs> you know, it just it, you, you can't get it. Uh, we have to learn to trust him. He knows what he's doing. Now, quite often in the scriptures, though, a house is a reference to a household, a family. That's what God's built. God's household is most certainly built upon his wisdom. This isn't talking about a physical structure. God doesn't need a house. <laughs> he doesn't need a temple. God is in his holy temple. I remember from my days in Catholicism. You know, contained within that household, we've talked about this before, you've got four cherubim. I mean, those things are going to be wild to see, let me tell you, when we actually see them. <laughs> Four seraphim, the 
holy angels of God. All the Old Testament saints. You know, still blows my mind thinking about Sister Catherine up there. I wonder already, you know, in the, you know, the, the month that she's, well, more than a month. You know, just about that she's been gone. Who she's met. Who she's talking to. <laughs> wow. Of course, the church saints, a great many that have gone on before us. You're going to have the tribulation saints to come in the future. And then those during the millennial reign will be found righteous before God. Before God finally says, okay, it's done. We're finished with this whole thing. Now we'll get rid of this stage upon which, you know, the saga of humanity has been set for the last 7,000 years, and we're going to produce a whole brand new one. That's going to be more incredible than the one. That, and, and man can even begin to, to, to grasp and fathom now the universe that's out there. Think what it's going to be. But those that I just listed, those will all be the righteous who are going to go out into eternity. The household of God. And those human beings will be those, you know, the, you know, the, the, the Old Testament saints, the tribulation millennial saints, they're going to be the ones who are still human beings who are going to populate that ever-expanding universe. It's just going to go on and on and on and on through all eternity. The seven pillars, okay, God's wisdom. <coughs> God's wisdom. There are seven manifestations of the Holy Spirit of God are these seven pillars. Go to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11. Good morning, sister. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. A branch shall grow out of his roots. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And in fact, we want to read verses uh, 3 and 4 as well. And shall make him a quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge after the sight of his eyes. Neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with a rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. So there's seven things there. And we're going to come to those here in a second that are those seven pillars of wisdom, the Holy Spirit of God. That's what his house is built upon. But go to the book of the Revelation. And we want to start first at chapter 1. <coughs> Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Go down to verses uh, Four, five, and then five, six. So Revelation four, five. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning about the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And then Revelation five, six. And I beheld lo in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. All right, so the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God manifestation there, uh, we have it, you know, first of all, back in Revelation 1, verses 12 and 13, we've got seven candlesticks. And then in Revelation 4, 5, 
we have it there as seven lamps of fire burning before the throne of God, and then five, six, the seven eyes. Uh, all these things are representations of the seven aspects, if you will, the seven representations, the seven uh, manifestations of the wisdom of God through the Holy Spirit of God. Back in Isaiah 11, 1 through 4, there we had uh, the spirit of wisdom. All right, we had the spirit of understanding. We had the spirit of counsel. We had the spirit of might. The spirit of knowledge. The fear of the Lord. And the spirit of righteousness, real righteousness. So those again, that's in Isaiah 11, 1 through 4. You want to go back and jot those down. Spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, the fear of the Lord, and righteousness. Every believer, quite frankly, ought to, as a part of their own personal Bible study, ought to do a word search of each one of these things to give you a good understanding here again of the wisdom of God. Pillars are structural members. Uh, they are there to support and to hold up the entire thing. Okay, and if the house of God, okay, the household of God, okay, <coughs> Are, is people. Okay. Okay. It's by these seven pillars, these seven structural members that are what support us and give us strength and help us to stand. The all those things that have to do with the knowledge, wisdom, and understanding of God. But of course, everything has to stand on a foundation, doesn't it? Okay, and that foundation is the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3. Some familiar verses here for you. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 9, 10, and 11. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building according to the grace of God which is given unto me a wise master builder I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is Jesus Christ so Paul as a wise master builder that's where he begins, and that's where every one of us begins, and that's how this is what we build upon, is upon that foundation, okay? That chief cornerstone, that head cornerstone that was rejected, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, 19 to 22. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth, unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Okay, so back over in our text here, you know, Proverbs 9, 1, Wisdom hath built her house, she has hewn out her seven pillars. Not talking about you know, uh, material building. It's talking about the household of God. In our particular case, okay, the body 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. Over in Corinthians uh, 6 and 7, we'll play, it tells us about how even right now, we're the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. That's what it's talking about. Verse 2, back over in Proverbs chapter 9. Proverbs 9, verse 2. She hath killed her beasts. She hath mingled her wine. She hath also furnished her table. Now the reference here, of course, is to the giving of offerings to God. You know, they would have animals that they were going to offer up to God and they would kill them and you know, burn them up on the altar. They would have wine that was poured out as a drink offering unto God. These were offerings of thanksgiving. They were offerings of peace and reconciliation to God. Okay. So again, we know we're talking spiritually here. And so we, we, we ought to be offering up okay, in our prayers our thanksgiving to the Lord and thanking Him for His knowledge and His wisdom and His understanding which He has provided for us. Okay, which work in us peace and reconciliation with God in our lives. You know, when you do things God's way, by His knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, well, I'm guilty of not doing that sometimes, you know. But, you know, it makes everything so much easier for you. It makes everything so much better for you, if you'll just do it God's way. <laughs> He's smarter than we are. Verses 3 and 4. goes on and says, She has sent forth her maidens. She crieth upon the highest places of the city. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. As for him that wanteth understanding, she saith unto him, and we'll come back to that there in verse 5, Again, still continuation of this metaphor uh, that the Lord's using here in this passage, this uh, personification of his knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Okay, the maidens here would be any of those means by which the Lord calls out to and reaches out to mankind to draw them in, to get them to turn in hither to him. It can be the creation. Okay, Psalm 19, verses 1 through 6. There. Psalm 19, 1 through 6. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter a speech, night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line goeth out throughout all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. That's one way that God calls out to men, reaches out to men, is by the very creation that's around them. You've got the Bible. Is one of the great ways in which God reaches out to men. Psalm 119, 105. Psalm 119, verse 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God's word gives light. So that man can see where he's going and where he ought to go and where he ought not to go. Preachers. Romans chapter 10. Preachers are one way that God reaches out. Looking at verses 14 and 15. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? 
And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Of course, she's quoting Isaiah 52, 71 here. And then the testimony of every faithful Christian, 2 Corinthians 3, 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 2. Christian testimony. Ye are our epistle written in your hearts, known and read of all men. God reaches out for the world of men through you, through your lives, through your conversation, as the scripture calls it, our conversation in this world, how we behave ourselves, what we do, what we say, how we look. All these things act as a witness and testimony to the world out there. So you need to be careful about what you're saying because you represent Him. All right, back in our text, verse 5. And okay, we'll go back to verse 4. It says, Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. As for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, Come, eat of my bread, and drink of the wine which I have mingled. Okay, the offer is to partake of the offering that has been made by the Lord through his knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Now, for us, of course, that offering is Jesus Christ. Okay. Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world, the shed blood of Christ. Go over to Acts chapter 2, verse 23. Acts 2.23. Here, Scripture says, Him, being the Lord Jesus Christ, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. It was the knowledge, wisdom, and understanding of the Holy Trinity that determined the plan of salvation before anything was ever created. He is our Lamb. And we must partake of His sacrifice through faith in His finished works on our behalf that he accomplished in order to have eternal life. And the Lord has done all of this for us. Okay? What we couldn't do, he did for us. So as to ensure for us an infallible means of salvation and reconciliation. God made sure that it was going to happen, that it was possible, that it could be obtained. It's up to the individual to partake in that. And we, how we partake in that, of course, in the church age is by salvation is by the grace of God through our faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 6. John chapter 6, long passage I'm going to read here. I'm going to pick it up at verse 48. And I'm going to take it down to verse 63. And there's purpose and reason here behind this. I am the bread of life. <coughs> now obviously he wasn't a physical loaf of bread. Of course, that's what comes out down in verse 63. But I want to read this only because there's been so much perversion, particularly by the Church of Rome, about, oh yes, Christ is our sacrifice and we have to consume him. <laughs> Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. Angels food. This, speaking of himself, is the bread that cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. He's not talking about cannibalism. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. 
The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Okay, they at least were smart enough to know that that's not what he was talking about. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And I can remember being taught that verse as a Roman Catholic child, that I had to partake okay, in the Mass. And that I was going to be literally eating the body and drinking the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, it made me sick to my stomach just thinking about it. I can remember one of my first communion, I was expecting to have this bloody mass of something shoved into my mouth. 